So you're planning on braving the open roads of the Commonwealth. You're either incredibly brave or incredibly stupid. Either way, it helps to bring a buddy with a gun. Or better yet, a buddy that doesn't need sleep that can watch your back while you catch a wink or two. Better still if they can go anywhere in any weather at any time. And even better yet, if they carry enough firepower to demolish the toughest fortifications. Thankfully for you, I recently came across a set of blueprints that allowed me to construct a robot workbench, a fabrication unit that allows an almost endless combination of parts from virtually every robot constructed by Robco and General Atomics. Though not some of the models manufactured by their subsidiaries, such as the various models of Securitron constructed by the H&H Tool Company and the Humble iBot manufactured by Repcon. I've consulted with mechanical experts from all over the Commonwealth, from experts in the field of biorobotics and mass production to the Brotherhood of Steel's chief mechanic responsible for repairing and maintaining such mechanical monstrosities as Liberty Prime. I included experienced and gifted engineers, and even your friendly neighborhood mechanics who know how best to keep your 220-year-old armored lifelines in tip-top shape. Together, we've analyzed every model of robot you could expect to find in the Commonwealth and have come up with a number of optimal designs using the robot workbench for robots that can both keep you safe out in the ways, keep your settlements running smoothly in your absence, or maybe just keep you from developing a hernia by toting around all those coffee cups and ashtrays you insist on picking up. To help demonstrate the various bots and configurations you could expect to find, I've enlisted the services of Ol' Sparky over here, who has graciously agreed to stand perfectly still this entire video or else suffer being condemned to a life as an armless, headless assault on torso with a handy thruster. I considered asking Jezebel to help out with this project, but uh, she was a bit indisposed. Anyway, if you're ready to dip your toes into automatron design, stock up on some circuitry, fiber optics, and steel as we set to work building our beautiful bots. The robot workbench lets us build any robot we want, but we still have to base all the major assemblies on those that were mass-produced before the war. So before we get ahead of ourselves, it's probably a good idea to look at the various pre-war models that will be serving as our donors and take a look at their pros and their cons. Now just to be fair, there are hundreds of robot variants found throughout the wasteland, each with their own different stats, abilities, so on and so forth. And many of the modifications that we can make to these robots bring that figure into the tens of thousands. So in the of this not being a four semester credit course, I will instead simply do my best to make the most accurate generalizations possible. I know, boo. Well, if you love accuracy and fine detail so much, go ask Rad King to make a video on the subject. Anyway, let's get to it. Um, Sparky, you're you're kind of pushing it, and we we literally just started. Okay, let's get you a guard post so you'll sit still. Okay. First, and certainly not least on our donor pool, is the Fearsome Assaultron. The Assaultron gets bonus points for being roughly humanoid in size and shape, meaning any place that's accessible by a human is probably also accessible by an Assaultron. Although bipedal locomotion isn't the most agile in nature, it does offer a lot of flexibility and maneuvering inside confined spaces, and the Assaultron is far faster than the Protectron, which is the only other two-legged model on this list. Okay, Sparky, you were warned. When people think of Assaultrons, they instantly think of the head-mounted death ray that ruins many a waster's day, and for good reason. That thing can harsh even the strongest mellow. But to be more accurate, this was an optional feature and not all Assaultrons came equipped with it, so it can be difficult to determine just how dangerous they really are at a distance until it's too late. The problem with Assaultron heads is that, regardless of whether you have the one with lasers or without, the sensors that ship with them aren't the best and their engagement distance is limited to very close range so they usually won't be the first ones attacking. They need some sort of warning system and then have to locate and close distance with an attacker before they can engage, which means you need your bot to be well armored. Also, their accuracy usually is quite poor, so be prepared for long engagements if you're relying solely on your automatrons for defense. The torso section allows for faster movement than the Protectron and has better health than the Protectron and Mr. Handy, but only just slightly. Its main draw is just how compact it is, allowing allowing it to fit into tighter spaces. Post-war armors like the Rust Devil armor or the Hydraulic armor definitely rob the bot of its slim figure, but all in all, it's a very good choice. The Assaultron's arms offer the highest melee damage of any robot, which is why you often see them outfitted with blades, claws, and all manner of pokey or smashy things. But they don't offer a whole lot in the way of carrying capacity, so they aren't the best option for gear mules. 
I was considering moving the Mr. Handy to the very end of this guide, mostly just because the Mr. Handy can be really hard to wrap your head around if you're just now jumping into bot building. You see, Mr. Handys don't use heads. The torso is the head, and, and torso. For sensors, it uses three separate eye assemblies that actually contain a full sensor suite that is surprisingly robust given their compact size. These actually are advanced enough to give the Mr. Handy a long engagement range, bested only by the Robo Brain. Although they came with three eye assemblies from the factory, allowing them to track multiple targets at once and giving them excellent depth perception, they are actually fully functional with only a single eye, which explains the sheer number of Mr. Handys still flitting about in all manner of disrepair. The legs, well, it doesn't need them. Instead, it possesses a thruster assembly that also contains the mounting points for three arms. The arms usually contain some sort of energy weapon. Why a domestic service robot needed that, I'll never know, but it was damned popular so people must have felt they needed it. They also contained one arm with a buzzsaw and one with a two-pronged pincer for more delicate tasks. The Mr. Handy isn't the most robust model out there, and its dependence on flight means it has very low carrying capacity compared to all other robot models. But the thruster gives the Mr. Handy a great deal of speed and agility and allows it to run across almost all surfaces. I mean, I would be careful around tall grass and stuff, but it can go anywhere. The thruster does create a single point of failure that a crack shot can exploit, so be warned. Like I said, the fact that it has three eyes, two of which mount to the arm sockets on most robots, three arms that mount to the leg slots instead of the torso, and no head assembly is just weird. But once you know what you're getting into, it becomes a very versatile chassis to build around as long as you have all the parts laying around. And the fragile nature of the handy can be mitigated with some post-war armor options. The Protectron was quite possibly the best-selling robot of all time before the war, and for very good reason. It just worked. All of this just works. It's not, I'm not kidding. Who the hell was that? When compared to just about any other robot on this list, the Petrectron isn't the worst in most categories. It just doesn't excel at anything. Its legs are slow, loud, and clunky compared to the Assaultron. The legs do provide it with a decent carrying capacity, but that's bested by the RoboBrain tracks and SentryBot rollers. The torso is fairly compact, but not as small as the Assaultron, and it has the lowest damage threshold of any model we've tested. Its arms are basically the reverse of the Assaultron. It offers higher carrying capacity but terrible melee damage if an enemy closes in. The head assembly does have a more impressive sensor suite than the Assaultron, allowing for slightly longer engagements, but it's bested by most other models. But even with all those issues, it's still not really a bot I would thumb my nose at, at least not for anything that doesn't involve heavy combat or long distance travel. Hospitals, construction companies, police forces, fire departments, even strictly customer service oriented organizations like public transit, amusement parks and museums availed themselves of the Patektron. It's a hell of a lot better than nothing, and as long as you don't need it to beat any land speed records, it'll get whatever job you give it done. There are post-war armor upgrades that can increase the Protectron's survivability, and some weapons upgrades can make them more effective over longer ranges than even Assaultrons. It just won't take as many hits before it goes down. So let's tackle this right off the bat. These things are unstable AF. I won't get into the reasons why here, but yeah, it's pretty messed up. However, if you're okay with the consequences should these things go rogue, then let's look at what they actually can offer us. Their sensor suite is second to none, allowing for highly accurate weapons fire and engagement at longer ranges than any other bot we have at our disposal. The head assembly also contains a built-in Mesmatron, so it does have some less than lethal options available, and much like the Assaultron head laser, it does add yet another weapon to your rolling death machine. The torso is very well built, and while it's one of the less compact designs, it'll still fit through your average doorway. The arms offer a great balance between compact design, melee damage, and carrying capacity, so if you don't like having to choose between the extremes offered by the Protectron and Assaultron arms, the RoboBrain gives you a nice middle ground. The coolest feature of the RoboBrain, I have to say, is the tracks. It's the only tracked bot on this list, and the ability to spread that weight out a bit means that they'll carry your robot over any terrain you could ask of it, and at blazing speed too. 
comparative to, you know, people. The Trax also offered a carrying capacity second only to the SentryBot. Even just outfitted with factory armor, the Robobrain can be a tough opponent, but it takes on whole new levels of survivability when given post-war armors. If you need a literal tank backing you up, the Robobrain could be just what you're needing, or it could be a massive waste of time. I'll leave that decision up to you. Okay, just in case someone takes those comments about the Robobrain's instability serious, these are based entirely on the established lore and the comically bad pathing and behavior for Jezebel. For automatrons, they will behave the exact same as any other NPC or companion character. They won't just freak out on you and stop following your orders because they've determined there's a better way to do things, although it would be pretty funny if they did. The Sentry Bot is an absolute beast. Nothing fills a would-be scavenger with more dread than the sound of a Sentry Bot booting up. Its torso offers higher durability than any other model. Even unarmored, it can withstand more damage than some models with factory armor installed. It also has extra mounting points for shoulder-mounted cluster munitions launchers, or even fat man rails, which is terrifying to say the least. Its robust arms and legs provide it more carrying capacity than any other robot model. Although nothing spectacular, the sensor suite in its head offers a nice medium range detection and engagement capability. But despite its fearsome reputation and objectively terrifying capabilities, especially with post-war armors mounted, it does come with a fairly alarming set of drawbacks. Most of these stem from the sheer size of this thing. I called the Robobrain a tank, but this thing is a literal tank. It just doesn't fit into tight indoor spaces, and it's not going to be an effective companion for dungeon dives. Also, that carrying capacity comes at the expense of speed, so while it might be able to keep up with a lumbering pack Brahmin, you're probably going to be stuck stopping and waiting a lot if you're trying to travel with one. And that giant size also means lots of machinery is needed to make it move, which means lots of heat is generated and must be dispelled somehow. During combat, sentry bots can overtax their cooling systems causing a temporary venting process where the back opens to force cool air in, but this also exposes the power cells to whoever the bot is fighting. A well-placed shot can reduce your homicide battle bot to slag. Also, while its head does contain a fairly adequate sensor suite, it's still not going to be able to engage at anything further than medium range. Now, all of this talk of the good, the bad, and the ugly regarding different robot parts assemblies doesn't mean there isn't a place in your settlement network for a robot with those parts. If you're stuck designing a robot and don't have the luxury of having a wide part selection, it doesn't mean that such a robot would be useless, it just means that its utility would be suboptimal. Take old Sparky here in this configuration, a non-laser equipped Assaultron head restricting this robot to close range encounters and being very inaccurate to boot. Protectron arms and legs which might offer decent carry capacity but poor melee damage, and with stock protector on hands, it's restricted to low damage melee attacks. Its slow legs means it just can't keep up with unreasonably fit explorers, and its sentry bot torso generating tons of heat could become more of a liability than an asset if someone ever exploits its Achilles heel. But even with this low damage, close range restricted, prone to explode configuration, this robot is not worthless. Here he mops the floor with these ferals I had causing problems. Problems. Is it perfect? Hell no, but is it functional until I can find better parts for it? You betcha. So if you've made the mistake of implementing less than satisfactory combinations of parts into a single chassis, don't fret. You just have to find a decent use case and tweak the design a bit. As I've mentioned before, there are a few different forms of post-war armor available, usually in the form of pouches strapped to factory armor to help them carry more, rust devil armor, which usually increases ballistic protection over factory armor and makes them look scary but doesn't do much else, and hydraulic armor, which usually offers the best ballistic defense and sometimes decent energy weapon defense as well, and gives some fringe benefits like increased carry capacity, speed, or melee damage. So with all that information available to us, let's roll up our sleeves and see if we can design the perfect robot. Now, if you were hoping that there was just one single combination of parts that makes an automatron perfect for all use cases in all job roles and all circumstances, I have some bad news for you. There just isn't one. Probably the most versatile is going to be your Assaultron, but if you've been paying attention, we've noted a fair number of valid shortcomings in its design. However, we can design a robot to fill a certain niche and come pretty close to perfection most of the time if we think hard enough about what we're going to include in the design. Based on interactions with 
with people from all over the Commonwealth and beyond, I've managed to glean that there are three main roles that folks generally attempt to fill when they employ the use of an automatron, mules, provisioners, and settlers. So mules have one major function, to lug your stuff so you don't have to. As long as you don't plan on relying on it too heavily to do your fighting, you can more or less build a mule completely out of a Robobrain's core and Sentrybot's extremities. Sentrybot legs and arms will offer very high carrying capacities, and the use of hydraulic armor will augment this figure even further. The Robobrain torso won't offer quite as much durability as the Sentrybot torso, but it also doesn't have that glowing one-shot weak spot, so it's a good trade-off in my opinion. The Robobrain head can serve to offer early warnings of danger since it's able to detect enemies at very large distances, and its Mesvatron can incapacitate enemies, making things easier for you to deal with. The weapons you choose to outfit this model with are largely up to you, but remember, this isn't a tank, it's a mule. You're supposed to do the fighting, and you're going to want to stay in front of it in case it Austin powers its way into a hallway. Contrary to what you might think at first, provisioners don't actually carry supplies from settlement to settlement. They're pack Brahmin do. The provisioner has one job, kill anything that poses a threat to your Brahmin and keep the beast moving. This model I think does a very good job of that. The use of a Robobrain torso I've already explained, and the use of tracks also makes this a great model for taking indoors. For keeping up with a spooked bicephalic bovine, you'll want the speed and agility provided by tracks. And just in case that word sounds a bit big for you, it has nothing to do with your Winky. The limiting use of a sentry bot's head is actually intentional on this model as the medium range restriction means your provisioner will still spot threats in a timely manner but won't be going off the beaten path hunting for threats as often. Plus, the red headlight means it can travel even at night and red light is less conspicuous. But of course, the minigun and heavy gatling lasers speak for themselves as to their reasoning. Don't eye the Brahmin if you've got any sense. The Robobrain arms offer a good blend of melee damage and carrying capacity. If something does manage to close the distance or you do actually need this thing to pack your stuff around for you. And the hydraulic armor besides giving it godlike damage absorption also increases that capacity too, making this a great companion to bring along for extended dungeon dives as well as keeping your settlements well stocked. Speaking of well-stocked settlers, from sweeping to shopkeeping, from tending crops to annihilating raiders that decide you got a purdy mouth, sometimes you just want a robot that can do it all. Enter the Mr. Blasty. The, the Mr. Pinchy. Uh, I'll work on the name later. At its core, this model is just a Mr. Handy fitted with hydraulic armor for added survivability. Its booster makes it very fast and agile. Its three arms, especially when equipped with two pincers and a buzzsaw, make it well suited to a variety of domestic service or even light construction tasks. And its use of a center mounted Mr. Handy eye assembly means it can identify and engage targets at long ranges. But since you only need one of the assemblies to be effective, why not swap out the left and right? units for Robobrain arms mounted with sniper lasers. Long range, heavy damage dealing weapons for long range optics. Since the three Mr. Handy arms are used for more delicate tasks, the weapons arms are purely for kicking ass, and if anything does manage to close the distance, it has a buzzsaw and well-balanced melee damaging arm assemblies to smash, slice, or otherwise pacify attackers. I personally love this model the most and find it to be the most aesthetically pleasing, which I really didn't think would be the case when I was considering how I was going to put this thing together. Still, your mileage may vary, you may think it's ugly, but you're wrong. I decided to throw a wild card in just for fun. In case you're not wanting a purpose-built robot and you're just aiming for the best balance of all worlds and don't really care about things like symmetry and logic, um, I present to you the lopsided loony bin. All the speed of a Mr. Handy, the durability, range capabilities, and mesmetron of a Robobrain, the devastating stabbiness of an Assaultron Dominator, and the laser-flinging madness of a Sentrybot. The bladed arm is all Assaultron, giving the best melee damage available, while the Gatling laser is a Robobrain assembly offering a bit more on the carrying capacity ends of things. I haven't tested this thing, but I imagine it would be very good for a wide variety of combat-related tasks, but probably not well suited to tending a field of Tato's. This thing is all combat, but at the end of the day, it makes a great traveling companion if that's what you're after. These are just a few of my ideas for what would constitute the best combinations of parts to fit these specific occupational needs within your fledgling empire, and I'd love to hear what you think of them. I feel like I'm forgetting something. All right, Sparky.
Anyway, I hope you found this helpful. Have you deployed automatrons with these exact roles or configurations in mind? I'd love to hear your examples. I'm about done, but I just wanted to say I hope you have a wonderful day. Stay safe, and I hope to see you here next time on Gray Gaming. Mm -hmm.